Hello, Anne. It Thank has started, you. yeah. <laughs> So the Society for the Social History of Medicine Executive Committee was delighted that Anne Harrington accepted our invitation. I'm sure she'll be pleased to know that a lovely bunch of flowers are on their way to her in the <laughs> EAHMH team. And I'll Aww. be with Anne about her choice of a book from our SSHM Manchester University Press series in thanks for her keynote. Anne Harrington is the Franklin L. Ford Professor of the History of Science at Harvard University. She is also Director of Undergraduate Studies in the History of Science and Faculty Dean of an undergraduate residential community called Fort Simer House, in which capacity she also serves as Chair of the Harvard Faculty Dean Community. She has written widely in the history of psychiatry, brain science and medical practice, and is the author, author of four books, including Reenchanted Science, The Cure Within, and most recently Mind Fixes, Psychiatry's Troubled Search for the Biology of Mental Illness. That was in 2019. The EAHMH committee have interviewed the keynote speakers about their interests in medicine and religion. So you can read more about Professor Harrington's approaches to medicine and religion on the conference website. And I'd also like to welcome anyone who's joined us um, because these keynote lectures are more widely available than the conference. Today, Professor Harrington will discuss almost a miracle, reflections on a medical archive at the boundaries of skepticism and experience. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and um, thanks to all the people who are here. Um, it's uh, 11 o'clock in the morning where I am. And so my day is still sort of getting going, but I know many of you have had a much longer day. So I appreciate all the more that you're taking the time to, to, to hear from me. Um, I'm going to just um, let you see a scene of, of mountains for just a moment as I, and then I'm going to hopefully, you should now see um, my first slide. Um, if if I, I spoke with the tech person uh, just before all of you guys came in and um, there was a little bit of issue with the connect if it turns out that my connection gets bad, I will turn off my video and I want you to know that in advance because I don't want you to think that I don't want to be, you know, a visible presence here. But um, uh, let's hope it works. Um, and let me just start by saying uh, how awesome I think the conference schedule uh, is that has been put together and how pleased I am to be part of this, this whole series, this whole set of conversations on the intersections of faith, medicine, and religion. Uh, what I want to do with you this afternoon has a lot to do, I think, with all of these things, with faith, with medicine, with religion, but I want to start by just setting the scene. Uh, so you're looking here at a picture of Lord. Um, Lord, a one-time impoverished, completely unremarkable town in southern France. It's in the foothills of the Pyrenees Mountains. It's not far from the Spanish border. But of course, it's today uh, one of the most famous uh, pilgrimage sites in Catholicism. All of us have heard of it. All of us have heard of it above all, I think, um, because we all know that Lord is where the miracle healings happen. And I know that there are um, quite a few people uh, from the program, quite a few conference uh, who are interested in miracle healings um, and are going to be talking about miracle healings in other contexts. So I'm excited uh, for the possibility of engaging with all of you from your perspectives about miracles and healings and Catholicism and more. Uh, but I'll, my focus will be just on Lourdes and um, let me get back to my scene setting. Um, we know about Lourdes as the place where miracle healings happen and some of us might be also know that Lourdes exists because about 150 years ago in 1858, a poor, uneducated 14 year old girl named Bernadette had a series of visions that the Catholic authorities, um, a lot of initial skepticism, eventually concluded uh, were, the, you know, were visions of the Virgin Mary. Critical to the story here is the fact that during one of these visions, this mysterious lady that the Bernadette was seeing guided the girl to a previously hidden, unknown spring of water in a grotto just outside town. When this became known, 
and believing this was a divine gift from the lady, local people who learned of the event began to visit the spring to bathe, to drink the water, and within very short uh, period of days to report miraculous healings. At this point, uh, things began to get pretty unruly. There were a lot of unorthodox ideas. There were a lot from the point of view of the church of magical thinking uh, being associated with some of the things that people were saying and doing. All of these unauthorized miracles were starting to get a little out of hand. Um, the best person to read about this part of the history of Lourdes is probably the historian Ruth Harris. Uh, who wrote a wonderful book about uh, 19th century lords, published in 2009, and documented all of the ways in which the church authorities responded uh, to this unruliness uh, that was being catalyzed by the visions in the first place, but now by the waters and their possible or potential healing powers in the other. And basically, once the decision was made that Lords was not going to go away, and that it would be better to embrace and integrate Lords than to fight it or suppress it. An elaborate structure was set up to domesticate this place. And one of the first ways that domestication was undertaken was by creating uh, various brothers now in charge of the shrine, creating a calendar of organized church sponsored pilgrimages to the site, which were focused on. Orthodox Catholic themes like penitence, gratitude, things like that. The first national pilgrimage uh, happened in 1873. By the 1890s, close to half a million pilgrims were going to Lourdes every year. And today, you know, at least uh, I don't know what's happened since the pandemic, but before the pandemic, the number of total visitors that go to Lourdes every year is estimated by the authorities to approach about 6 million. They don't all anymore go on organized pilgrimages, but a great many do. But Lourdes was not only domesticated through this system of pilgrimage uh, that uh, were put into place in the, um, in, starting in the 1870s. Um, and it was not, not only domesticated spiritually. Uh, what happened also at Lourdes, and this now was in collaboration with local secular authorities, is Lourdes was also modernized. Early on, uh, it was modernized in part uh, because the local secular authorities were eager to capitalize on the economic potential of a, being a site where miracles were happening. There was a brief period when the mayor of Lourdes hoped that or thought maybe we could turn Lourdes into a spa because it was a large spa culture in the Pyrenees Mountains, and but there was nothing interesting that they could find in terms of minerals or the composition of the water, so they had to abandon that. But, uh, but they had capitalized in other ways. Um, early on, a decision was made to build a new railway line that had direct service to the town, because prior to that, it could take 33 hours to reach Lourdes over narrow mountainous trails from the nearest biggest city, which was Bordeaux. Um, a wide range of printed promotional materials began to be regularly shipped to local parishes across the country promoting the site. Hosp uh, hotels were built, lots of hotels. I'll just say that even today, only Paris has more hotels than Lourdes. And then with time, guidebooks, wax candles, bottles uh, for the water, and all sorts of cheap and plentiful uh, religious kitsch objects begin to be sold everywhere. Again, this is not my uh, work. This has been beautifully analyzed and documented in another excellent and uh, relatively recent study of Lord by Susan Kaufman called Consuming Visions. My focus here is primarily on the fact that through all this domestication, through all of this modernization, Lord continued to be both understood and actively promoted as a place that at its core had a healing mission. A place that was set up to be especially welcoming of the sick and a place that also inexplicably, at least sometimes, healed people that the medical profession had given up on 
had given up on because they were deemed to be incurable. So here's my question. How was Lord able to sustain its reputation as a modern, domesticated, well-regulated place while still allowing itself to be a place where real miracles sometimes happen? And a key part of the answer lies inside the door of the building that you're looking at here. Established in the 1880s, it sits on the grounds of the sanctuary. It's a simple, even rather drab office that was originally called the Bureau of Medical Verification, but is today simply called the Lord's Medical Bureau. The job of this office, uh, which is run by a medical director, not a priest, you know, not a brother, uh, the job of this office is to listen to all claims of extraordinary healings that are brought to its attention and then begin a process of unbiased investigation to determine which among these cases are in fact so astonishing as to be completely inexplicable from a medical scientific perspective. And once a case is determined by the medical authorities to be inexplicable, the office sends a report with that conclusion onto the bishop from the Pilgrim's Parish, and it's the bishop who then decides whether or not he will invoke the term miracle to describe the case. If he does, then the case is officially sanctioned and the good news is spread far and wide. So another way of understanding this office and its uh, partnership with the church is to say that the creation of this bureau sent a clear message that when it came to Lords, it was no longer going to be up to individual pilgrims or to the enthusiastic crowds that bore witness to their experiences to decide when something truly miraculous had happened. That job now needed to be left to the medical and religious authorities. So I want to give you a sense of the optics at play now in this gatekeeping space called the Lord's Medical Bureau. These are some pictures I took on a visit uh, of the, the pictures of the interior spaces of the Bureau. You're looking here at the secretary's office. And I don't know what your view of this picture is, but when I look at it, you, I might imagine that I'm looking at the front office of an insurance company or a real estate office. Uh, rather than an office that's in the business of investigating real miracles. You're now looking at the office of the medical director. He's currently an Italian uh, former pediatrician named Alessandro de Francisis. Um, I don't know, this office to me, businesslike, clearly with a Catholic touch, a touch imposing, but very much uh, a place of business. This is the modest room on site for examining patients who might want or need to be looked at immediately. And finally, here is a room that is filled with the records of every case that has been brought to the Bureau for assessment ever since it was set up. The cases go back to the late 1870s, actually a little bit before the Bureau was set up. Um, and there are today well over 6,000 in the archive that you're looking at. You're just looking at one wall. The uh, cases fill um, three separate walls. And in a little while, I'm going to have a lot more to say about this archive. But first, though, I do need to set the scene just a little bit more because while well, I think uh, the larger reason why the Bureau was set up or why it, how, why, what, you know, the larger function of the Bureau is broadly clear. What I still do need to explain to you is how it does its work, because it turns out to be quite important for where I'm going. Um, I don't know if uh, Jacqueline Duffin, by some, you know, thrilling uh, chance is in the Zoom room here, um, but uh, she's written, uh, the definitive book on a different Catholic office called the Congregation for the Causes of Saints in Rome, which exists to oversee processes leading to canonization of saints. And also in the course of doing that work, 
pays a lot of attention to miracle healings. Uh, the Bureau is modeled after the Congregation for the Causes of Saints. It's modeled after the, its processes are modeled after the processes uh, by the office. Um, and there's probably a lot of other things you could say about similarities and differences between these two offices. But here, what I just want to underscore is that both uh, the Lord's Bureau and the congregation, when confronted with a potential miracle healing, are enjoined uh, by the church to use the very, the same very strict criteria for judging the credibility of the claims. And they go back to principles that were laid down, actually much older than you might think, laid down by the 18th century defender of the faith, the devil's advocate, uh, who later becomes uh, Pope Benedict the uh, Fourteenth. Uh, but when he laid down these principles, he was uh, called Prospero Lambertini. So these principles to be called the Lambertini principles. Uh, a devil's advocate in the church exists to ensure, particularly in when there's a case of a saint canonization, to ensure that every Every possible weakness, every possible objection to potential canonization is aired and reviewed. And when it came to the, uh, the miracle healings, Lambertini insisted that several clear criteria must always be met if a miracle healing is to be considered valid. One, they must have a verified physical component they're not interested in recovery from mental illness or from the disorders that are seen as functional. There must be something tangible, visible, physical uh, that is changed. The disorder also must have a terminal or chronic prognosis. You can't have a case in which there's a possibility of spontaneous remission. The third, and this becomes one of the trickiest uh, to meet, particularly as you know time goes on, treatment could have played a role in the healing. And finally, the healing in question must be sudden, it must be complete, it must be permanent. Now, the decision to model the work of the, but the decision you know, by the Lord's Bureau to model itself after the work of the congregation was, on the one side, a really useful way to put the local medical and religious authorities back in charge of the whole miracle making work at Lord's. But it also served another function that is very specific to Lord's and to the time of its founding. Uh, in the second half of the 19th century. Modeling itself after the work of the congregation also offered a way for 19th century Catholic doctors down at Lourdes to push back against a new kind of medicalized anti-clericalism that was becoming a hallmark in these years of uh, certain parts of secular French medicine, particularly French neurology. And, you know, more specifically, um, I'm sure um, a number of you recognize that a photo that is on my left, I don't know if it's on your right, but the photo of the uh, doctor and the fainting woman on the, uh, in, in the top corner, that's Jean Martin Charcot. Uh, specifically, men like Jean Mar Char uh, Martin Charcot and other French neurologists uh, in uh, dialogue with him uh, had recently reinterpreted uh, a disorder called hysteria as a kind of a trickster disease. People with hysteria, they look like they're sick. They look and act, say, like they're paralyzed or like they're blind or like they're suffering from epilepsy, but they aren't. All of their symptoms are products instead of a mix of suggestion and their own fevered imaginations. And this meant that all of their symptoms also could potentially be cured by a mix of suggestion and imagination. And even before Lourdes, some of these anti-clerical neurologists had begun to say that given what medicine was now coming to understand about hysteria, it seemed really likely that the supernatural history of Catholicism, its ecstatic saints, its miraculous healings had no real spiritual significance. 
It just involved a lot of undiagnosed hysterical people responding to the suggestive theater of Catholic religious ritual. And now as the Lords began to take off in a big way, it was pretty easy for these same secular neurologists to look at what was going on here and say, you know, and make the same kinds of arguments. But now by embracing the Lambertini criteria, which as I mentioned, a priori dismissed any disorder with a potential emotional component or with the potential for spontaneous remission, the doctor at Lourdes felt they had the tools to fight back. Um, uh, they were gonna show that they are up to date, as up to date as the Paris doctors about that great pretender disorder called hysteria. They weren't gonna be tricked by them. They would send them packing. Uh, you can see here the uh, quote from Gustave Boissy, uh, Boissari, uh, we observe at, at Lourdes all the same kinds of things that the Paris doctors see in their hospitals, but we are not tricked. We treat these facts with the greatest reserve. We never rely on them to prove supernatural intervention, he says. They're gonna focus, they uh, insisted on strictly physical disorders that are impervious to the influence of suggestion. They would emphasize durability. They would emphasize permanence. No one would be able to accuse them of gullibility, of bias, of insufficient rigor, or at least um, that was the hope. The reality turned out to be more complicated. Secular medicine continues to develop over the years, of course, and as it does criteria for what actually constitutes a rigorous, unbiased evaluation of a medical case also changes. It turned out that simply invoking the Labertini criteria on their own wasn't strictly enough to stave off the critics. And so, the bureau directors realized that just as Lords had modernized, they also had to continue to modernize. And here the archive in the bureau is a really good way to see how that process played out. You see, for example, in the early years, uh, in the late 19th, even into the early 20th century, there was a lot of use of dramatic before and after photos, uh, like you're seeing here, uh, as a way of demonstrating uh, a remarkable, potentially inexplicable recovery. What you're looking here at is a um, set of photos from a woman suffering from tuberculosis um, at death's door in the photo on my left uh, and robust and healthy and completely, uh, presumably pure, uh, uh, permanently cured on the other side. Tuberculosis, by the way, was one of the very frequent uh, forms of a uh, disorder that un well, around which people experienced miraculous healing until the advent of antibiotics. But this was a very common early one. This was a very common case, a very well-known case, by the way. You're seeing here in the corner, uh, the bottom corner, a little postcard uh, of this case. It ended up in the end actually not being uh, created, uh, uh, judged a miracle, uh, but it was at the time quite a famous case. Uh, and it was, you know, the evidence was in the photos. Uh, the evidence also in the early years was also deemed to come from testimony from a few believing physicians uh, who had examined the patient shortly after the, um, you know, the miraculous cure. So what you're seeing here uh, is medical testimony from an eye doctor on a case that in fact uh, was approved, was uh, declared a miracle, though, so I will say her name, Marie Biret. Uh, she went blind after uh, the wasting of her optic nerve. She recovered her sight in Lourdes, uh, even though when doctors examined her, the optic nerve remained degenerated. And Dr. Laney here uh, is in no doubt in this letter that uh, he writes to the Bureau that this is medically inexplicable. He writes this in 1908. 11 months later, Biret's uh, recovery from blindness is formally declared her bishop to have been a miracle. So this is how things worked in the late 19th and early 20th century. But as you look through the archives, you begin to Get, it begins to become clear that by the 1920s or so, this kind of coach 
take some photos, get some testimony from a few physicians who you know have an expertise in this area of medicine and examine the patient. It isn't enough. A new generation of Bureau Direct now begin to ask pilgrims, ask their doctors to submit direct visual evidence of change in the disease tissues and organs. X-rays become a routine part of many of the investigations into an alleged miracle healing. And you see here, uh, some of those X-rays. And by the way, today, uh, it hasn't really changed. The same basic impulse to have documented visual transformation of disease tissue is still part of present in the investigations. Uh, except now the technologies are much more likely to be modern imaging, use modern imaging techniques like MRIs. They come in on DVDs now instead of in the form of film. So that's part of the change you see as Lourdes increasingly attempts to become, the Bureau increasingly attempts to become more rigorous, uh, more scrupulous, more modern. Uh, but something else also changes. A new consensus begins to develop that they had not been looking at patients for a sufficiently long period of time. That this thing that happened, like in the case of Marie Beret, a mere 11 months, no longer enough. Today, an investigation into a potential miracle routinely lasts for a full 10 years to really, really dig down into the Lambertini insistence that a cure is not only complete, but it's enduring, it's permanent. And as that decision begins to come online, you also see something else uh, in the mid uh, 20th century, I think in the late 1940s, 1947, I think they introduce uh, an additional layer of, uh, of check. Uh, on the work of the Bureau, an international committee of doctors, which meets several times a year to review and make final decisions on cases in progress. And so with all of these evolutions and all of these changes, we end up today in a place in which outsiders can now write admiringly that, you know, when it comes to rigor, when it comes to thoroughness, uh, this is from a blog from just a few, uh, you know, last April, uh, even skeptics, Robert Wise, uh, this Catholic blogger has writes, even the skeptics have to, have to admit that the Roman Catholic Church has an impeccable process before an event uh, is accepted as a miracle. With the result that in the, over the past 150 out of more than 7,000 cases submitted for investigation, only 70 miracles have ended up making their way successfully through the procedures and being officially recognized. Now, I just said with the result, and maybe you heard me kind of hesitate, because that's actually the question. Is the Bureau's allegedly impeccable investigatory process the reason why over the past 150 years, there have only been 70. I don't know how many of you are surprised that it's so few, or maybe you're <laughs> amazed that there's even 70. It'd be interesting to hear. Uh, but let me just let the, leave the question hanging. Is it because the Bureau is so rigorous, is so skeptical that we have these, these 70 miracles and no others? Well, let me probe uh, that question a little bit. I've mentioned now a couple of times that this archive contains over 7,000 dossiers. Uh, you would think that out of 7,000, this would add up to a relatively diverse pool from which to identify your true miracle cases. And, and you would think that even taking into account the fact that many, many people who experience something profound at Lourdes uh, don't report it. Uh, they say probably there's, you know, 90% of people don't even report it. But even in that 10%, 7,000 is pretty big. You think it would be a pretty diverse pool. But when you look at the sanctioned cases, they are strikingly homogenous. All of them 
are white Europeans from countries with strong Catholic traditions. 55 out of the 70 have come from France, eight from Italy, and a smattering you find from Germany, Switzerland, Belgium, England, in case any English people uh, are curious, nope, has never had a case. Ireland, Catholic uh, Ireland, has never had a case. There is one case uh, that did come from outside Europe. It came from Algeria, but it came from a time when Algeria was still a French colony. But beyond that, 75% of all of the sanctioned miracles are women. And the majority of these women are nuns. And even that's not all. When you read the stories, the stories behind each of these sanctioned miracles, there's a remarkable homogeneity in the plot lines. This is the basic Lord's plotline miracle. A suffering person as Lord's versus him or herself in prayer or spiritual ritual or taking of the waters just before healing with no expectations, by the way, no expectations, they surrender to what will be, will be. Then just before healing, his or her symptoms generally get worse. There's a moment generally of despair, but then he or she feels a compulsion or hears a commanding voice. And there's an experience in their bodies of intense heat or intense cold or sometimes electricity-like energy and their suffering might intensify briefly, but suddenly something changes. And in a flash, they know they're well. They feel well, and they, more important, they emphatically know that they have been cured. And crowds who either right there or soon after testify to their physical transformation. It's visible, not just internal. It's instantaneous, it's complete. They then experience gratitude, they experience euphoria, and actually also classically get super hungry. They are, experience enormous hunger, and often a lot of these scenes end like the hotel room where they eat a big meal. But this also signals their further return to health, to normalcy. Now, Here's my suggestion. My suggestion is, as historians, our antennae should now be twitching a little bit. My suggestion is that there's something about the investigatory process carried out by the Lord's Medical Bureau that seems to result in a distinctly narrow and homogenous set of sanctioned stories and outcomes a distinctly narrow demographic, mostly white nuns from France. And yes, by the way, I couldn't resist putting this up. This is me having a cup of coffee in 2019 with the most recent sanctioned uh, miraculé, the French nun, Bernadette, who had come to the Medical Bureau to do a series of, you know, be participate in a series of panels. Uh, so what is it of the process? How can we find out why these are the miracles, why they look the ways that they do. And here's my suggestion. Maybe we haven't been thinking about this archive, the Lord's Medical Archive, in quite the right way. Maybe we should th stop thinking about it as a repository of medical acts, some are extraordinary and possibly miraculous, and most of which are. Maybe instead of thinking about it as a repository of medical facts and medical cases, we should instead think about it as a repository which documents thousands of complex encounters between ordinary people of faith, people who believe they've experienced something extraordinary, and various medical and religious authorities whose task it is to judge that experience. And if we think about this archive as a report of encounters, 
rather than a repository of miracles, we suddenly can begin to at least ask questions about, about biases, about pinch points, about bottlenecks, about other factors beyond the plain medical facts that might explain why Lourdes has the mix of official miracles that it has. So this is what I would like to explore in the remaining time that I have with all of you this afternoon. But before I turn to this, I want to pause just a moment and note that I now intend to share some insights from the archive that are not on the published record. Uh, and for this reason, um, I will be anonymizing all identifying details uh, associated with specific cases. I won't be sharing any information that could conceivably allow any individual patients, even those who are no longer alive, to be recognized. Um, I've thought a lot about this and looked at a lot of sort of sources on you know, the ethics of um, working on doing secondary analysis on a uh, primary archive. Um, and this can be uh, you know, the best way forward. It's true that every person associated with a dossier in this archive did at one time agree to be investigated by the Bureau and actually starting in the, 18, in the 1980s, they all signed an informed consent uh, form, but none of them agreed to be part of any secondary historical analysis of the Bureau's archives. And so I wanna respect the fact that they might not wish to be identified in any analysis. Um, I also want to acknowledge uh, at this point, the support of the medical director, Sandra de Fr de, uh, Francisis, who generously opened up these archives to me as an historian. Uh, and last, it's the profound limitations of everything I'm about to say, uh, because I've still only looked at a really small proportion of the thousands of dossiers in the archive. This, is a, this project I'm sharing with you is still very much a work in progress. It's actually one that would benefit from a lot more hands and eyes. Uh, but still, what can we say? What can I say to all of you today? Um, well, let me uh, start first by talking about looking beyond the sanctioned miracles and looking at parts of the archive of rejected miracles that first correspond to the kind of things we would probably expect to find. Uh, we see, uh, for example, a reasonably significant class of encounters in which pilgrims report experiences to the Bureau that are clearly deeply meaningful to them, uh, but which are immediately dismissed by the doctors as, if, you know, we're not going any further with this. Um, the medically, they lack any element of inexplicability. They are not surprising, they lack spectacle, they lack gravitas, they could all easily be explained in other ways. Some examples I've seen include a case in which a marathon runner experiences unexpected relief from chronic back pain after visiting wards, and a diabetic, I've given a quote from that case up here, who finds that he needs less insulin than he had before drinking the water. So these are the skinniest dossiers, the briefest uh, you know, investigations. Uh, a person writes and the bureau director generally responds with a brief formulaic letter in which uh, he thanks the pilgrim for his or her testimony and wishes him the best. Another category of rejected miracles that we again would also probably expect um, are the kind that the Bureau was, in its origins, set up largely to guard against. Uh, cases of pilgrims whose miracles are deemed by the medical uh, establishment to be largely in their own imaginations. There's both less wrong with them than they think, and the recovery is less remarkable than they think. Yet they write repeatedly to the Bureau, uh, asking for recognition in the eyes of the doctors, seeking attention. And the task then becomes, how do you manage them? Um, you know, in an appropriately, you know, Christian, compassionate way. And here you see uh, a quite, I think, revealingly patronizing quote from a letter written mid-century to the Bureau by the family doctor of one of these 
kinds of pilgrims, um, in which, you know, doctor to doctor, he makes clear that they both know the truth. Um, maybe she's got something a little bit wrong with her, but we won't be able to help her physically, as he puts it, until she's been sorted out by the psychiatrists. Yeah, but from he, so those are the two kinds of the not, no real services with categories. But now I begin to get into categories of cases of rejected miracles that are a little bit more complicated. Uh, because in these cases, while medical considerations still matter, they are not the view of them is clearly not just being driven by the medical facts. I'm talking now about cases in which patients sometimes report pretty amazing medical facts for what they're worth, but they embed them in stories that do not follow the standard narrowed structure of a classic Lord's miracle stories. Maybe they happen off site far away, or maybe they use water from the wrong place, or maybe they celebrate the wrong kind of supernaturalism. So I'm uh, the note that uh, you see on the top of this slide uh, was penned on top of a report of a case of healing that didn't happen in the sanctuary, but happened to someone while walking in the mountains uh, outside of town. And in this case, there had been no devotional rituals. There was no supplication to the Virgin. There were no acts of penance. Instead, roughly speaking, the story this pilgrim told involved first her companion seeing visions of her sort of in the you know, bushes on the path. One of them then suddenly sensing what was wrong, feeling the pilgrim symptoms in her own body. And then some ritual acts that involved this pilgrim laying talismans given to her by her companions onto her damaged body areas, followed then by a dramatic healing over several weeks. The correspondence in this encounter is almost completely one way. The pilgrim writes repeatedly to the Bureau. She comes by to see the director in person. She wants to share her story. She sends photos, she even Christmas card. And she keeps either not getting any response or getting a very brief response. And it's obvious that this case didn't stand a chance and it didn't stand a chance think not just on medical grounds, there may have been good medical grounds, but it also didn't stand a chance as this quote kind of, you know, you know exposes on theological grounds. Uh, one bureau doctor, I think kind of summed up the issue here. He didn't, wasn't talking specifically about this case. He was talking about another one, but what he said is all inexplicable facts are not enough to allow us to speak of miracles. There's also a particular set of religious circumstances. And this case did not adhere or align with those sets of religious circumstances. Now, there are other cases of failed mills in which the bare medical facts, uh, again, were not sufficient. Uh, to move things forward, and they surprise us in different ways, I think. Sometimes, it turns out, doctors might, in fact, conclude that a medical work is, is just extraordinary. And yet the case could all the same not move forward to sanctioned status. So what you're looking at here is the final page of a report from the late 1940s. It's signed by 16 separate doctors, all attesting to the inexplicable nature of a case of recovery from, again, tuberculosis. Uh, I won't tell you the name of this person, but she turns out she was actually really well known. There had been a lot of newspaper coverage uh, of her remarkable cure. Everyone expected the sanctioning to be just a matter of time. But what happens is then Bishop, from this person's parish stops the process. He has required, convened a committee of his own to review the report from the Bureau of Doctors, and he was not impressed. He felt the case had some features that had deviated from this Lambert rule, and he also felt that politically approving this case would not reflect well on the church. 
it would surprise the believers and offend the unbelievers, as he put it. And so he vetoes it. And he also goes to the trouble of writing a letter back to the bureau, to the doctors, um, kind of um, scolding them uh, for failing in their responsibilities. And they've gotten their heads turned by this case. And he expresses the wishes you see here that their considerations be brought in the future more closely in line with the rules laid down by Pope Benedict. Another somewhat similar case, we see the daughter of a woman decades after the fact, uh, the, um, inquiring after the status of an investigation into her mother. Her mother had become famous at Lourdes in the 1920s for her remarkable recovery. She was also a well-known case. It had never, you know, why hadn't it been properly recognized? She asks. The medical director basically passes the buck. He says, look, there had been no doubt on the part of my colleagues back then that this recovery was as he were produced. But the bishop had declined to convene, in this case, had declined to convene a committee. Uh, he just hadn't gone ahead with it. And so this case had been in limbo for over a half century. And uh, he then says, you know, well, you know, it's a, not a lost cause. Why don't you write to the parish? and see if it might be possible to restart the final evaluation, but we can't do anything. Our hands are tied. Now, in these two cases, the bishop, not the doctors, were the reason that a case was medically remarkable ends up getting aborted. But here's another surprise. There are also a lot of cases, maybe a lot more than you might think, when it's the pilgrims who decide to pull the plug. Even when the doctors themselves are persuaded that the medical facts here are really pretty interesting, why do they pull the plug? Here's my first perhaps unexpected uh, explanation or one uh, unexpected reason. They're defeated by all the paperwork. You know, and it's really quite erotic in the course of seeking over decades to ensure that their process is impeccable, the Bureau has ended up creating a system that's almost guaranteed to discourage compliance on the part of most ordinary people. They require complete medical records now to be gathered and submitted. They need updates to be resubmitted yearly for years. Patients are also asked to come to Lourdes on a regular basis for independent in-person examinations. And as I said, this whole process can last for a decade. A lot of people just give up. And this is um, what I'm about to say now, I have no direct evidence for, but it has struck me. It has just occurred to me uh, that maybe this incredible kind of burden of paperwork uh, and compliance with medical directions is one reason why nuns make up such a large percentage of the sanctioned miracles, because maybe they are more likely to comply with the procedures demanded of them because they've taken a vow of obedience and because they believe it's their spiritual duty to do so. I don't actually know if this is the case or not, but it just struck me, maybe. So paperwork is one reason why pilgrims withdraw. But another reason why so many pilgrims, more than you might think, withdraw has to do with the ways that the authorities at Lourdes over the course of its history have chosen to use these miracle stories as part of their promotion of Lourdes as a miracle site, as a holy pilgrimage site. And they've done this sometimes even before the stories are formally sanctioned. And what the point, the reason this is problematic is this decision, this approach to the miracles has the effect of thrusting every potential new case, uh, especially if things are moving in the right direction, into the limelight. It has the effect of turning them into a celebrity. Uh, and, oh, and most don't want that. Over and over, you see in the archive notes like the one I've copied above, I am afraid of the spectacle. There was one woman who even talked about her children being taunted at school because, you know, her mother's a freak. She's the miracle lady. Um, in fact, this distaste for the celebrity the unwanted celebrity that they're experiencing is so intense that 
a few pilgrims have even gone public about it. You're looking at a still from a 2008 video interview with an Irishman named Peter Clark. Peter Clark had a stunning experience of recovery from multiple sclerosis in 1997. Uh, I won't go into the story, but it corresponded in all the ways that uh, both the religious authorities and the medical authorities might have, might have wished. The case was progressing rapidly to a likely successful conclusion. He decides to pull the plug, and I'm going to let him tell you why in his own words. With it. As the years went on, it was becoming more, more of a what would I say, a circus nearly. Um, and I didn't want it. I just didn't want it. So some people actually treated you as if you could perhaps fast track them to a miracle. Absolutely. Like I, I, I would find like, and I don't, I don't mean it in badness towards anyone, but they'd be touching you and, you know, when, oh, I have to rub off you and, you know, it wasn't me. I felt that, say, regarding myself, people were, were coming with me to be with the miracle man. You were called the miracle man? Yeah, you know, and I didn't like that. I, I, I like being just, being part, being part of a group, just being an ordinary Joe Soap, hidden in the corner, leave me, leave me there. Let me do my own thing. We could obviously talk about this uh, in the discussion, but um, hopefully this, you know, kind of underscores this point. Um, but, you know, and there's other points. Um, it is an issue of paperwork. It's an issue of unwanted celebrity, but it turns out that some other people pull the plug or struggle with the possibility of formal recognition because they're worried about what effect it will have on their relationships, on their relationships with loved ones, with friends. Maybe they worry that pe you know, people might think they were malingering before, or maybe they hadn't really suffered in the ways they claimed. And there was one amazing letter that a pilgrim shared with the doctors about how she had never understood the biblical story in which Jesus asked the cripple, do you want to get well? You know, then she thought, like, why would anyone not want to get well? But now she understood. There is a cost to recovery, just like there is a cost to sickness. She could lose friends. She could be the focus of envy, of doubt, of resentment. And she concludes in this letter, I am left with the same question. What to do? What to say? And even that's not all. Some of the patients who worry about losing their identities as sick people worry about it for a different reason, a practical reason. Here's an excerpt from a letter, this is from the early in the new millennium, from a patient who had been living off social security disability for you know, a number of years. And she worried, what will happen if she is actually declared by the Bureau to have been miraculously cured? Is it possible that the insurance companies would get suspicious? Would it be possible that they might even, she might even be forced to pay back years of claims? And she says then, she concludes, of course, you know, the glory of God and the salvation of me and my family is more important than these, than these mundane benefits, but I also have to keep my feet on the ground. And finally, there are still others who struggle with the recognition process and in some instances, withdraw from it because they don't know how to explain to themselves and to others why they have been blessed with a cure, but others haven't. What made them more worthy than other suffering people at Lourdes or elsewhere? So one of the most poignant examples of this dynamic that I saw was in a case from the uh, late 20th century, the woman who had been, uh, the woman in question had been healed, the woman who had been healed uh, had suffered from a grave genetic disorder from which, and this is the significant point, her brother also suffered. And actually she'd originally gone to Lourdes not to seek a miracle for herself, but just to resign herself spiritually to whatever might be, probably her death. And then when a miracle happened, she kept it private. 
She kept it private for over a decade before finally deciding that she needed to report it to the Bureau. But part of the reason for her long hesitation is uh, made clear in the quote above. Uh, this is taken from a passing comment in a report that one of her doctors wrote to the Bureau. The issue is that both she and her brother were devout Catholics. Both suffered terribly from an illness over which they had no control. And the brother could not understand why God would have chosen in the end to heal his sister, but not him. So where does this leave us? Well, in answering, let me first summarize where I think uh, I've been with all of you this afternoon. Um, the goal of this conference is to explore historical intersections of faith, medicine, and religion. And I have wanted to argue that the healing sanctuary of Lourdes is a very rich site for explorations like these. Uh, but I focused uh, in my uh, exploration of Lourdes, especially on the Lourdes Medical Bureau, which I explained was set up in the late 19th century to manage and pass judgment on healing miracles. And then I focus still further on the archives in this bureau, which I explained to you contains the dossier on every single case ever brought to the attention of the bureau. This archive is generally understood to be a repository of remarkable medical claims, only some of which end up being validated as truly miraculous. Given how homogenous and narrow the sanctioned miracles turn out to be, I wanted in my talk today to ask if there is another way to think about this archive, not just as a repository of a lot of failed miracles and just a few validated ones, but as a repository of thousands of encounters between a wide range of ordinary people of faith and various medical and religious authorities whose job it is to be skeptical of their experiences. And maybe studying these encounters, I suggested, rather than the outcomes, could teach us something about how and why Lourdes has ended up with the official miracles that it has. And I think that we did learn something. I hope we did. I'll be fascinated by the conversation to follow in a couple of minutes, but what I do think the archive does show us is that miracle making at Lourdes uh, is a far more complicated procedure than the standard understanding of the Bureau's so-called impeccable process would have you think. Uh, the archive show us that the process of managing all of these powerful experiences of faith through rigor and medicalization and skepticism is still imperfect. There are bureaucratic bottlenecks. There is too much paperwork. Uh, but the archives also show us something we might not have expected. That a lot of the reasons why, or many of often, the reasons why miracles don't go forward is because patients decide not to go forward. And one of the reasons why patients decide not to go forward is that it turns out that experiencing a miracle and maybe particularly having a miracle assessed has costs. Unlike what the standard Lord's miracle story would have you believe, um, the experience doesn't always simply result in joy and gratitude. It sometimes causes fear, it causes uncertainty, it causes guilt. There are cases in which for both pilgrims and their loved ones, being in the presence of a miracle doesn't just reinforce faith, it tests it. So my conclusion is that in all of these ways, the archive at the Bureau of Lords has turned out to be a place of surprises. Unlike what we might have thought, it begins to open up for us the possibility that the most important lessons to be gleaned from Lords for historians like all of us who are interested in interest in the faith, medicine, and religion, that the most important lessons here might lie not so much in the public domain where most of the attention usually but rather more in the gaps between the official stories and the real lives and experiences of the millions of people who visit there. Thank you so much for your time.